Hi, Representative Waring. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I wanted to talk with you about juvenile justice issues that have come up in the first year of the two-year legislative session. Um, so that's 2021. We've made it through the long session, almost. Um, and we've seen a number of interesting juvenile justice bills come forward and other issues arise. And you have been at the center of all of those. So we wanted to get your perspective um, on those. Um, do you have any initial reflections on the juvenile justice issues that have come up? Yeah, thanks, Ann. Um, it was an important year. And I think, you know, the, the governor a year ago today, actually, his task force on racial equity uh, in criminal justice, the report came out with 125 recommendations. A handful of those recommendations uh, addressed the juvenile issues. And so we were really pushing, for instance, raise the minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction. Many people don't realize North Carolina had the youngest age in which we could put six-year-olds in our juvenile court system. Wow. Uh, the task force looked at that, we studied it, we had juvenile experts come in, and we recommended raising that to 12-year-olds. So six through 11-year-olds would basically get services if they needed it, but they would not be petitioned into a juvenile court. That was one of the big issues. Uh, prosecutor discretion on when you could transfer kids to the adult system or keep them in the juvenile system. Um, juvenile life without parole was another issue that came up. And then the governor suggested a juvenile sentencing review board. So it's been a big year with a lot of recommendations. We've made a lot of good steps. I don't feel they've gone far enough, but uh, we're not going to stop. That's really great. And those are all huge um huge issues to tackle, and so it's exciting to hear that those things are getting attention. Um, I know that when we first saw the recommendations from um, the various commissions and task force that have looked at raising the minimum age, um, the recommendation that came forward was to raise the age to from, six, from age 6 to age 12. Correct. I wonder if you could just talk briefly about your experience as a juvenile court judge um, and why you think it was important to try to raise the age at all? Well, we looked at what is the brain development of young children, and are they really able to have criminal culpability when they're six or seven or eight years old, when they're in first grade, second grade? Um, if they are petitioned into court, what is their capacity to understand the nature of the criminal proceedings? What the judge is saying, you're adjudicated delinquent, can they really help their attorney in their own defense? So looking nationwide at other states, looking at other countries, looking at the recommendations that we had from juvenile justice experts, uh, the recommendation was to raise it to 12, which we thought was the minimum age at which kids could really understand what was going on, understand the consequences that were being given, and relate it back to what the offense was. Um, with legislation, as you know, uh, it, it's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. We compromised, and uh, with the Sheriff's Association, the DA's Association, they said, we can't go up to 12, but we probably can agree to raise the minimum age to 10. I didn't like that because it doesn't follow the science. It doesn't follow the brain development. It doesn't follow you know, criminal culpability of young children. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to help them rather than put them in a courtroom um, so the, the, the final analysis is uh, there were several bills that were filed and the one bill that was passed does raise the minimum age from 6 to 10 for all misdemeanors, all felonies, except for 8 and 9-year-olds. There's a carve-out that if these kids are thought to have committed a serious felony that they still could be put in the juvenile court system. which kind of defeats the whole philosophy behind it, that they're too young to understand, they're too young to help their attorneys, that we can get them services in other ways. But we, we took what we can get and that's what passed. And so the juvenile age now, six, seven year olds will not be in our system. Eight, nine year olds, if it is a serious felony, they could be petitioned to court. That's a really helpful explanation. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what some of the arguments we heard were about why we needed to only raise it to 10 instead of 12. 
Uh, it was pretty much from law enforcement or DAs that these kids are capable of committing serious crime. It's an impulsive behavior. They need to get services, understand consequences. I mean, it's a, a punitive approach. Mm -hmm. If you want to help kids, you can help them much better with social services, with counseling, with mediation, with family involvement. Um, I was a judge, and I do remember times we would have petitioned in the court six, seven, eight-year-olds, and basically they were school offenses. It was disorderly conduct, throwing pencils, acting out. And as a judge, you would watch this kid who couldn't even touch their feet to the floor, and they would have a coloring book while well, the judge is going through the proceedings with the prosecutor and the defense attorney, and the child is totally oblivious to what's going on. Uh, get up, leave the courtroom. How effective was that? Mm -hmm. You know, Whereas if we could get counseling for them outside the court system and get family involvement, that, that's the real key. So we, we didn't make it up to the age of 12. Um, I think uh, as more studies are being done, more recommendations are coming out from the Division of Juvenile Justice, we're gonna try it again. That's great to hear. Um, one thing that I saw as a lobbyist was it seemed as though the Conference of DAs was especially pushing this idea that there needed to be a carve out um, for more serious felonies. And like you were just saying, it doesn't follow the science, right? I mean, if a kid um, can't be criminally culpable at age eight or nine, then they shouldn't be in court at all, regardless of what incident occurred. Um, I'm just curious if you have any reflections on that and kind of how that debate happened at the General Assembly. Well, uh, as you know, being here, surprises happen. And when the Conference of DA spokesman person comes up and argues to the legislatures, we shouldn't be doing this, kids are capable of finding a gun and you know shooting a gun and they should be criminally responsible, most of the members go, ah, oh, right, we, we got to address that. There's also another component that, you know, the, the racial equity. I mean, it is shown that uh, kids of color, black kids, are at least four times more likely to be brought into court at a very young age. And that starts a trajectory for further involvement. Um, that's why we wanted to keep them out. That's why we wanted to get them the social services help that they needed. But as I said, it was a, a first step and so uh, I'm pleased that we, we are keeping about 1,100 kids who have been petitioned to court over a three-year period. They will no longer be eligible. The number of felonies is very minor, so we're helping the greater number of kids. It's really exciting. I mean, would you say that passing this raising of the minimum age is a, a, a key effort in stopping the school-to-prison pipeline? Yes, absolutely. I think it, it, it's a good beginning, and uh, we'll keep going with it. That's really great. So I know another more challenging issue that came up this legislative session was um, a proposal to end the practice of juvenile life without parole in North Carolina. And um, I wonder if you could just explain really briefly for folks, what is juvenile life without parole? Well, juvenile life without parole is when a young person under the age of 18 has committed a serious offense, and usually it's murder or a very serious sex offense. And the sentencing judge would, in the past, give a sentence of juvenile life without parole. And I think currently we have, I don't know, a couple hundred in prison now that were sentenced before they were 18 for a bad crime um, that they had no possibility of parole. Now, our federal courts have said, you know, they have to be resentenced, that uh, unless you find that a child was incorrigible and incapable of rehabilitation, that they should be given an opportunity for parole. So a bill was filed to eliminate juvenile life without parole in North Carolina. Uh, it did get to a committee. We were just about ready to vote, and uh, the chairman of the committee withheld the vote. Uh, we have Republican sponsors. Uh, it's an important bill. More than 91% of every juvenile who got sentenced to life without parole is black or a person of color. So the racial disparities and inequities are horrific. One good thing I will say, Governor Cooper appointed a juvenile sentencing review board. Uh, I'm the chair of that, four people are on it. And we are reviewing all the cases where they have not been resentenced, but juveniles have uh, spent at least 15 to 20 years in prison 
some have juvenile life without parole, to look to see if they would be eligible for the governor to grant clemency. Um, it, it's a lot of work. We, we have met a few times, we've made recommendations, and we're really hopeful that the governor will look to the fairness, equity, and mercy uh, that these were children. And many of them were not the perpetrators of the offense, that they were uh, co-defendants. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they deserve a second chance. Absolutely. I'm, we're grateful for your service on the on that board. And, um, you know, just for folks watching, I wanted to make sure folks understand the bill that was put forward um, to, to end the practice of juvenile life without parole in North Carolina. Um, how would it work? At what point would a juvenile who has been sentenced to one of these very for one of these very serious crimes have access to even the opportunity for parole? Well, if we eliminate that, then they would be eligible for parole whenever they've served their minimum sentence, and they would be able to get what we call a MAP plan uh, to try to plan for a release. Now, not all juveniles who would come up for parole would get it, but at least it would give hope. Uh, it improves behavior within the prison facility because they are hopeful that if they're good behavior without infractions, they would be eligible to be released someday. And often for these very serious offenses, I'm assuming that the minimum sentence is still quite long. Oh, so. yes. At least 20, 30 years. Right. So, so we're the, talking about an 18-year-old, maybe a, sorry, a 17-year-old perhaps, who was sentenced and is has to wait still 20, 20 to 30 years right. before they even have a chance to request the opportunity for Exactly. Release. So that 17 year old would have to be 47 years old before they would be eligible to come before the parole review hearing. Right. So it's not like, a, it's not exactly leniency. It's really um, still, right. still using a very punitive approach, even with juveniles, um, but giving them some hope of the potential um, that if they if they work hard and change themselves, they could potentially be released. Exactly. And many of these were young, as we talked about brain development, especially mm -hmm. males, it's not fully developed your frontal lobe until you're 25. And they're still, they were still youth. They were still immature and impulsive. And usually it was more than one that was involved in a serious offense. And should we condemn them to die in prison without possibility of parole? Or should we say, you know, 20, 30 years is enough, uh, and now it's time to see if someone's been rehabilitated, can have good reentry back into the community with family support, work support, and it's humane. And most other states are doing it. So why do you think that there is pushback um, against what seems like a very uh, logical and merciful policy? Unfortunately, it becomes a partisan issue. And uh, I think party leadership, once they take a stand and they listen to the Sheriff's Association, that is a very powerful lobby, or the DA's conference, also a very powerful lobbying group, um, they kind of go with what they, they hear. Um, there are many ways to look at it. And, and I think, you know, common sense tells you um, 30 years for one offense uh, is enough time to pay if you have shown you can be rehabilitated you can be released to society and be a productive citizen. And there's no there's no scenario in which someone is automatically released That's right. um, if they've been sentenced to life. In That's right. It's just the opportunity to go before a parole review hearing uh, and have your case be heard. And victims have a big say in it. They're often brought in, and, and many victims or the families of victims, you know, after that period of time, um, I think they also agree there should be a chance for... Uh, redemption. Mm -hmm. um, some no, but some yes. And is the Juvenile Sentencing Review Board, um, of which you are a part, um, receiving any information from victims, notifying victims of the process? How, how are victims considered in that? We are not. We are simply looking what has happened since the offense to what has happened in prison. Uh, what degrees have they attained? What certificates? Have they done any work release? Uh, do they have infractions? Are they remorseful? Have they written personal statements? Then we will give a recommendation to the governor. Only the governor's office will reach out to victims or the DAs at that time. So we're waiting for that. Great. Um, well, I really appreciate your time today. Is there any other reflections that you have on kind of the work of the task force on racial equity, the work that you've been doing this session, your hopes for 
um, the coming short session? I think, you know, after the events of George Floyd, uh, criminal justice reform is front and center in a lot of people's eyes. Uh, there was a big bipartisan effort, and Senate Bill 300 had many provisions for criminal justice reform, and I think that is a good sign, and it's enlightenment. Uh, we spend so much on prisons and incarceration, uh, but we have to look at the humane aspect of it. You know, do we cage people forever for something that they did when they were a teenager? Um, I'm hopeful. I think we have a lot more to go. We look at you know things like the equity of cash bail for young adults if uh, they can afford to get out on bail or if they can't afford to get out on bail. Uh, the death sentence, you know, how it is applied uh, with racial disparity. So there are many, many issues that I think we've just kind of taken a, a first glance at. I think we have a lot more to do with juvenile justice, with culpability, with capacity. I think we're, we're learning a lot more. Um, and, and I say that reflecting on my own experience when I started out uh, as a prosecutor in juvenile court. And it was thought then the way you get these kids help was to bring them in the system. And now, you know, with reflection and knowing, putting kids in the system is not the way to get them help. Uh, it, you know, the psychological impact of a young person who's still in grade school being adjudicated delinquent is a label that stays with them for the rest of their lives. And I think we have the ability uh, by statute to change that and really do a lot more good for these kids and families. Well, we're optimistic too that we can get more wins this coming session and we're grateful for your work um, in winning, raising the minimum age this session. It's a, a huge victory. It, it, it is a victory. We have a lot of work to do with schools. Uh, the role of SRO officers has always been a big conversation. You know, are they there to petition kids into court for school infractions and behavior? Are they there to keep the perimeter of a school safe? Um, so I think that's a, an issue that we will keep looking at and uh, try to stop the flow of kids from the schoolyard into the court judicial system, possibly in the prison. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.